All right, welcome back everybody. Today we're going to talk about Golang, why I'm stuck on it and why it rocks for parsing JSON or I guess REST API data. Um, I've been using Golang pretty much like only for the last several months now and I've pretty much become addicted to it. Like it really is one of the best languages to deal with REST APIs and it's wicked fast, it's a compiled language, all of that fun stuff. So let's dive into the code. If you want to follow along, copy and paste the code, use it for whatever purposes you have it for, um, I will leave a link to my blog post that is essentially on the same exact topic. I've got all of the actual code that I use in there, so you can copy and paste it a lot easier. There's not really too much of a point in me making a GitHub repo for this, but you know the code will be there, it'll be on screen, whatever. Um, so there's a lot to ignore here. Um, I've got a lot of the stuff kind of closed down. Um, until we actually specifically look at these functions and our structs. Um, but let's start with the main function. So I've got my API key for DigitalOcean in a .env file over here. I'm not going to open it up because I don't want you to see my API key. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be pulling down droplet data from DigitalOcean. So I've got a ton of droplets created there for my cybersecurity startup Grabber app. Um, I don't think I'll be showing any like particularly interesting information on screen for that, but um, you know, basically what this is going to be doing is pulling down information about all of the droplets that I've got created on DigitalOcean. So we load in that API key right here using the go.env um, library. We load that in right up here. So that is by Joho on GitHub. Um, so you can go check that out. It basically just will pull your dot in um, information or your environment information. We're going to use the URL library um, to create a path to the actual endpoint that we're going to be hitting. Um, I'll leave a link to the DigitalOcean um, documentation that will tell you more about this path, but basically you're going to send a get request to this path with your API key in order to get all of the information about your droplets. Not super interesting, but that's, that's basically what we're doing here. Um, we've got some error handling here just in case something goes wrong with creating that path. Um, but we're using the base URL constant that we create right here. So that's just the base URL of the DigitalOcean API. Um, and then we append the v2 slash droplets um, path to that. Um, so we'll print out our URL right here just to make sure that we get it right. And here we create our own function to return a request object to us. It's basically just a helper function that is going to take in a method, which we're going to be using git here. That's why we passed in that string right there. We're going to pass in our API key and we're going to pass in the URL. And it is going to either give us an HTTP request object or an error. Um, so let's open that up. It's really simple code here. We create the new request here, passing in the method and the URL. This right here is if we had a post body. Um, since I didn't use post methods at all in this um, in this example, the you know basically I, I didn't bother like you know using that or having that as a potential use case, so I just passed a nil here. Um, so some error handling right here. Then we're adding our headers. Um, so this right here is where we're using our API key. Um, it is a you know basic auth um, schema that we've got here. Um, and then we are defining the content type here and returning the request object. So right down here is where we are getting our request object. I actually didn't do any error handling here, which means that this is ugly code. Um, now here's where we're actually doing the request. We're creating our client here and we are running the request right here. Now response is going to get an HTTP.response object. That's not super useful for us right off the bat. Um, what we're going to do right here is parse the body out of that response object and we'll get a byte array. That is also not super useful. I can actually show you how not useful that is. Format.println res body. So let's print that and we're going to go ahead and return, return um, so that we don't continue. Let's open up our terminal. Let's do go run main.go might get an error for not using some of our okay so there we've got a bunch of bytes okay so that is obviously not super useful let's pop down here and you know your next response might be okay well let's parse it into a string okay we can parse it into a string good idea fairly simple to do let's open up our terminal again clear it out and we run it we get our url 
And now we've got something that is at least a little bit useful. What I've done in the past is I've basically copied, pasted this out into a JSON file, and then prettied that up using the um, VS Code IDE or VS Code thing. Um, I don't think it's formally called an IDE. Anyways, so that will give us at least human readable data, but it's not parsable. Now, here is where Golang gets awesome. We're going to talk about why Golang is awesome. Um, what Golang allows you to do is it allows you to declare custom structures that are going to hold the data that you want and then parse your data from your REST API into those custom structures incredibly easily so that you can access those items as if they were a normal object. So I'll kind of show you how we're doing this here and then I'll show you the structures that we're creating first. So here we're creating an empty structure, right? And here we are going to unmarshal or basically parse our res body, which is right now just a byte array, into our empty structure. And down here we are able to access all of the items or all of the fields within those custom structures very easily using dot notation. Now let's go up here and here's, here's how the magic actually works. So if we look right here at our JSON string, you can actually, let me go ahead and do the thing that I was telling you about. Let me grab all of this and we are going to go over here and create an example.json. I do this very frequently, that's why this is kind of muscle memory to me. And we can format the document. All this should be properly formatted JSON. It's not, of course. Don't know why. That's interesting. I guess it's technically right. This is just kind of weird looking data. Why did it parse that way? Anyways, um, let's go up here. Hopefully it'll be parsed a little bit better. Yeah, so it's parsed a little bit better up here. So as we can see, the first item within our JSON blob or our object is a droplets array. That is going to hold all of the objects, the sub objects that hold information about our droplet. So each one of these individual items within this array is an individual droplet. Now normally, I could parse this stuff out fairly easily and close it and do all of that fun stuff, but it's not letting me do that. I um, wonder where the parsing problem is. Right here, it looks like. Yeah. Huh, there must have been a weird like carriage return or something like that. And then tags. This might fix it. Yeah, there's just a bunch of weirdness with the parsing. Anyways. Let's go back up here. So each individual droplet's going to have an ID, it's gonna have a name, we're interested in those, and we're interested in the created at date. That's the information that we actually want to parse out. So if we go over here, we're going to create an initial top level structure called droplets. And all droplets is, is an array of individual droplet objects. Um, now, this is our subfield name, drops. Then we've got its type, an array, of droplet. We can see that we created that struct down here. Now this right here is where the magic happens. This right here is a tag that tells Golang if you are parsing a JSON object into this structure, this field is going to be denoted by this field name within that JSON blob. So if we look at this JSON blob, droplets right here is the field name within the JSON blob. It is going to take anything that is in droplets and parse it into the drops field within the droplets object, okay? And then these individual items are then going to be parsed into this droplet structure. This right here has an ID, which is denoted by this. So we can see in the tag, JSON ID within these back ticks right here, that's just what is telling Golang, this is how you're going to parse it if you're parsing out of a JSON object. So it is going to parse all of the information out of this JSON blob and parse it into these individual ob or these individual fields right here of type int, string, whatever. And we are going to then be able to access that through drop or through dot notation. So we see dot id, dot name, dot created at. Now we can also parse out sub objects or nested objects. So if we look up here, we've got an image object, which is I think what's actually throwing off our parser. Um, so we've got our image object right here denoted by the image field name within our JSON blob. So that's how we parse it out right here and we are parsing it into another nested object with an ID and a name. Now if you'll notice, 
we are not parsing out all of the data. So we don't care about the vCPUs, we don't care about the disk, we don't care about locks, blah, 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 blah. We don't care about any of this information. All we care about are these couple of fields that we've defined. Golang, if it sees any other fields that you haven't created a tag for, it just throws them out. It says, okay, he doesn't care about it, neither do we. So it, it just ignores it. All it is actually paying attention to, all it is parsing out is this information right here. What's really cool is if this information right here is not present. So for example, if we had a droplet that didn't have an ID for whatever reason, and we try to parse out that ID, all it's going to do is drop a zero into the structure itself, okay? So we can actually check to see if the ID is present or not, but if the ID isn't present and our code is trying to print it out or do something with it, it's not a big deal. It's just going to say, okay, this is zero, who cares? Or this right here would be an empty string. That's awesome for cases where an API is returning objects that may or may not have a specific field. There are tons of instances where this has happened. You know, for example, if I had um, DigitalOcean allows you to attach um, basically external storage to an individual droplet. So if I wanted to check and see if an individual droplet had that storage available there or not, I can define that the droplet is going to have the storage. And if it doesn't, then once all of that information gets parsed out, all of those fields will just be blank. So, for example, if right here we didn't have any droplets created on DigitalOcean at all, and this array were empty, that would normally break another program that didn't have, like, you know, that was using a language that didn't have these kinds of, uh, you know, these, these kinds of um, features present when parsing out information into structs. Right here, all, what, all that would happen is this for loop just wouldn't run because the drops.drops .drops array would be empty. So it just would skip over that array. But, you know, since we do have droplets created, we are going to, in fact, be able to run this. And once we run it, we should get all of our pretty information printed out very nicely. So we've got our name, created at, image info, all of that fun stuff. So I went a little bit more in detail in my blog about why this rocks and was probably a little bit more clear there. But I can't express to you how good the developer experience is when using Golang and hitting REST API. I mean, it really is better than Python and just about any other language that I've used to hit REST, REST APIs, not REST APIs. Um, Rust, I believe, has a, a similar approach, but you know, at least with the very limited context that I've used Rust in, Golang had a much better developer experience. I, I think, honestly, as much as Rust is cool, I think Golang's developer experience is significantly better than Rust anyways. It's just the learning curve is significantly smaller. It's much closer to a Python-esque language with the power and speed of C. You know, so it's it's a compiled language. You can hit, you know, OS resources and things like that through Golang. I'll probably end up writing some malware with Golang just to kind of have fun with that. Um, you know, and it's got all of like the features there, but significantly less learning curve than Rust. Um, and it's much, much faster than Python and has all of the support that, you know, you could ask for. So that's really about it. I, I guess that's, you know, this video is more or less a way for me to kind of express my love for Golang. Um, if you enjoyed this, if you learned anything from it, um, like, comment, all of that fun stuff. Take it easy. Peace.